up tonight? I'm going to attempt to do this lecture without my glasses, but I've got them here in case I need them. Okay? So tonight we're going to talk about some common foot and ankle problems. All right? I'm going to give you kind of a brief overview of a number of them, and then when I'm done, we'll let you guys have at me. You can ask all the questions you want. Okay? So, here we go. The first one we're going to talk about is bunions. Okay? So, you know, what is a bunion? What are the symptoms? How do they develop in the treatment options? Um, a bunion is basically uh, a two part deformity. We start at first with the big toe starting to drift over towards the second toe, as you can see here. And then as that progresses, we get a widening of the angle between the first and second metatarsal bones. Those are those long bones behind your big toe. They're kind of analogous to the metacarpal bones in your hands. So as that angle increases, the foot becomes wider. The big toe continues to drift over towards the second toe. And typically, the first symptoms that we get involve what we call the medial side of that big toe joint, or the side closest to the center of your body. And usually what's happening there is because the foot gets wider, it starts to rub into your shoes. And there's some very small nerves and vessels that run right underneath the skin. And if you push on that area, you'll notice there's really not a lot of cushion there. And so when those nerves start to rub up against the shoe and then the bone underneath it, it starts to hurt. Okay? Sometimes we'll get a little bit of redness or swelling there because you can develop a little what's referred to as an adventitious bursa, kind of a little fluid-filled sac, almost like a water balloon, and it just kind of cushions that area. So for some folks, you know, they'll tell you, you know, it hurts a little bit, but then sometimes it just gets big and red and swollen, and it may stay like that for a couple of days, and then, you know, eventually it kind of goes down. As this progresses over time, because that big toe is not sitting on that joint the way it's designed to, it's kind of tipped to one side, that puts a little extra wear and tear on the joint, and that can start to create some pain within the joint. That's usually the second kind of pain that we feel, and that's the beginning of some arthritis. Okay, so initially the pain starts kind of on the side, and then, you know, that's when we start to hear people say, well, you know, it hurts even when I'm not in shoes. Sometimes just moving it up and down hurts. Okay? So, of course, all of that. Oh my goodness, by the way, I'm going to tell you, I'm not a strict adherent to following my slides. When I get going, sometimes I just go. So I probably have talked a lot about how you get a bunion already. So you want to do a quiz? No? All right, I'll just keep going. So I think we talked about most of this already. Um, so, you know, the widening of, of the, the first intermetatarsal space and the drift of the big toe are predominantly caused by the way your foot is structured, what we refer to as the biomechanics, kind of how your foot hits the ground and reacts with the ground as you move about. And ideally, there's a nice balance, okay? All the muscles and tendons and ligaments all pull in directions that kind of complement each other, and they keep things straight. But in a lot of folks, you can look backwards here and you can start to blame mom and dad and grandma and grandpa. If you look backwards, you inherit a kind of foot that reacts with the ground in such a way that it becomes a little unstable. And that causes some of the bigger tendons to start to pull a little bit unevenly. And it starts kind of this cascade of the toe drifting over and ultimately the increase in that intermetatarsal space. All right? Treatment options. Basically, treatment options come in one of two varieties. What we call conservative or palliative measures, which are basically non-surgical ways to make you feel better. <clears throat> because anytime we're treating someone for a bunion deformity, our, our goal 
is to make you feel better and function better. Okay? So we can use things like padding and taping and, and bracing, trying to splint the toe over, that sort of thing. We can give you medications like you know, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug like an Advil or a Leave or a Tylenol to help with the pain. You know, we can even do physical therapy. Kind of the same thing. We're trying to knock down some of that soft tissue inflammation to allow you to function better. Sometimes you can use things like orthotics or arch supports to kind of get that foot to function better, okay, to improve that range of motion, that sort of thing. And for some folks, these things work very well. For some folks, it's as simple as being more cautious or conscientious, rather, about what kinds of shoes you wear. I go back to the big toe moving over and that increase in the angle makes your foot wider. So for a lot of folks, you know, you go and you buy shoes, particularly today, it's very rare that you see what's referred to as a Brannock device. What everybody in this room knows is that big silver and black thing that you used to stand on and they'd slide things back and forth and measure your foot. They don't do that anymore. They actually have those devices and they keep them hidden away and when you ask them to measure your foot, they give you that, oh, I can't believe I gotta do this. <laughs> so anyway, what happens is, you'll go into a store and, and they'll say, what size are you? And you'll go, I'm a size 10. And then they'll run out there with three boxes of shoes, nine and a half, 10 and 10 and a half. They'll throw them in front of you and they'll wait for you to come up to the cash register. The problem with that is, as your foot widens, what's gonna feel better is that bigger shoe because most shoes are shaped in such a way that as you come farther back in the shoe, it becomes wider. So you'll just start buying a longer shoe. Sometimes it works, but if you're very active, particularly if you're gonna try running or, or you're just on your feet all the time, what you'll probably find is that foot tends to slide forward in the shoe. And now you're back with the same problem. So if you're gonna try to solve this by getting different shoes, the first thing you have to do is make them measure your foot. Make them measure both feet. Make them measure both feet with you standing up. Because one of the things that happens when you get a bunion deformity is that when you stand up, your foot tends to do what we call splay a little bit. So it's even wider when you're standing up versus when you're sitting down. So make sure they measure your foot when you're standing up so that we get the true width of your foot. Now you can buy a shoe that's fitted both for length and width, okay? So if all of those things fail, that is when we start looking at surgical correction for bunion deformity. When we've got pain that we can't alleviate and allow you to become as active as you want to, okay? Oh. We already talked about changing shoe types. I warned you. This is how I work with this. So, essentially when you look at treating someone surgically for a bunion deformity, you're looking at approaching this in one of two different ways. Ideally, what we would like to do is reverse those things that cause the bunion deformity in the first place. If we take that increased intermetatarsal angle and we bring it back down where it used to be, it allows the big toe to move back over where it's supposed to be. That's what we'd like to do. In some folks, we can't do that for either medical reasons. They've got um, diseases that prevent them from being a candidate for that type of surgery. Or sometimes they've got a lot of arthritis. And so we're more concerned with giving them a joint surface that is pain free. So, as you can see, you know, they list about what, four different types of procedures here. And when we talk about things like a simple bunionectomy, that's when people used to be, and, and this is, wow, I, I think this kind of fell out of favor maybe 30 plus years ago, where you would hear about folks that would go in and they would just shave that bump off. And those are the folks that would come back to you five, 10 years later and go, my bunion came back. Well, yeah, because you didn't do anything to fix the deformity. All you did was knock that prominent area of bone off. And unfortunately, when you do that, you decrease the joint surface 
on that metatarsal head and now you set yourself up a lot of times for degenerative arthritis because your joint surfaces don't match up. So we try to avoid that at just about any cost. We don't want to do that. We want to salvage that joint and we want to recreate that foot in the best functioning position we can. Okay? So without trying to get too gory here, essentially what you're doing here, and you can kind of see it, you can see clinically where you've got that bone out like this. And what this is showing you here is, is that where that little greenish blue piece of paper is, is that's where that metatarsal head used to be. So in this particular case, you can kind of see it. You see those two little screws there? So what was done is they, they made a cut in the bone and they slid that joint over to realign the joint. And then you put two little small screws in there to hold it in place. And you can see how it was closed up there. The reason that we use things like those two little screws is because it allows us to do a couple of things. When you cut a bone or when you break a bone, if you fall down and you break your arm, what's a doctor going to do? He's going to put you in a cast, right? Reason for that is for bones to knit back together, you got to hold them still. If you let them wiggle all around, they don't tend to heal. So those two little screws allow us to hold that bone in place without needing a cast. And the reason that's important is because when we realign this joint, it doesn't really matter if that toe is nice and straight, but it doesn't move up and down like we want it to. It's not going to be real functional. So by using those two little screws, what we've done is we've realigned that joint and we've avoided using a cast, which means that while you're recovering, you can sit there and wiggle those toes up and down, which is what we want you to do. The earlier we can get you to move those toes up and down, the easier it's going to be to restore that motion. And if we don't put you in a cast, then you don't get the stiffness in your ankle, you don't get the weakness in your, uh, your calf muscles, so your rehabilitation is much easier. Okay? Yes. Cut it from the bottom of the foot and put it on top from a scar? From a scar, yeah, we sometimes will move our incisions more along what we call the medial side, more on the side. We do that. You don't really want to cut on the bottom because that's an area where you're going to stand and you're going to put a lot of pressure on. The skin is thicker there and it tends to create a bigger, more adherent scar. So we really don't want you standing on the scar, but yeah, a lot of times we will take that incision and do what we call move it medially so that when you look down, it's very difficult to see the incision because it's on the side. Okay? So hammer toes. If you know anything about bunions, you probably know about hammer toes, right? So we're going to go through the same thing here. So what's a hammer toe? A hammer toe is basically where one of the smaller toes, okay, starts to bend and buckle. Now, traditionally we talk about it bending at this first joint here, what's called the proximal interphalangeal joint. But the reality is, is, is as this deformity progresses, you get deformity at all three joints there. So the toe, the toe will buckle up like this at all three joints. Now, when that starts, when that starts, it's usually very flexible, okay? And when it's flexible, by that what I mean is, is you can stand there and look at your feet while you're standing still and the toes look kind of straight. They may have a little bit of redness on the top of them. What's happening is, is as you're standing still, all of the tendons and all of the joint uh, capsule is all nice and relaxed. So when you first get this deformity, what happens is, is as you're moving, remember we talked about the balance of the tendons and the joints and the ligaments and everything with respect to a bunion? Kind of the same thing's going on here. You start walking and those bigger tendons start pulling and what happens is, is as you're walking, those toes are flexing up and bending in your shoes. And that's why the first thing that you'll notice a lot of times is you get out of your shoes from wearing them all day and you go, why are the tops of my 
my, my smaller toes are, why are they kind of red and sore? Well, what's happening is those toes are repetitively hitting into the tops of your shoes. And so that's how that begins. The progression from there, okay, is that these toes become more and more what we call rigid. So now when you stand there and you look at your toes, you, you may notice, you know what, they, they seem to be kind of bending up, but I can reach down and I can straighten them out. I can try to force them straight and, and that works. But for a lot of folks, this continues to progress and they become less and less flexible. And as you might imagine, the less flexible they become, the more apt you are to have symptoms. Because now, you know, they're sticking up in the shoe and they're not just periodically hitting it, they're just hitting it the whole time you're walking. And now the tips of the toes are starting to drive down into the ground, not on the nice, you know, pulpy part of the bottom of your toe that's got cushion in design to, to hit that. Now they're hitting on the ends of the toes. So, as you see, this is all the things we just talked about. When these things really get to be problematic, now what will happen is, is as the toes become more and more rigid, now they don't reduce, and now a lot of folks will start to get pain kind of on the ball of the foot. They may even develop a, a callus underneath there. And what's happening is, is that those toes are buckled up rigidly, and so now when those tendons pull, you know, if you, if you take your, your finger here and you buckle it this way, the thing that you notice is, is that part of the, your knuckle goes down. Same thing happens in your feet. So now that metatarsal head is being pushed down into the ground harder, okay, and it becomes sore. And what will occur for some folks is you'll develop, like I said, a little callus. Corns and calluses are the same thing. For some reason, that I have no idea why, and I'm not about to spend any more time looking it up. When we have a callus that forms on a toe, we call it a corn. When it forms on the bottom of your foot or on your hand, we refer to it as a callus. But it's the same mechanism that causes it. And what it is is actually a healthy response. Your body recognizes that the skin is taking too much pressure, and so it knows that if it doesn't thicken the skin there, and protect it, you'll wear a hole in it and you'll end up with what we refer to as an ulcer. So I guess you could look at it as a healthy response, although unfortunately for a lot of folks it becomes a painful response. Okay? So we've already talked about this. Um, you know, the imbalance of the digits, or excuse me, of the tendons and soft tissues around those toes. Um, for some folks, yeah. You know, you can have an injury, you break a toe or something like that, and, and years later it, it causes you know, arthritis at the joint and, and contraction at the joint. But for most folks, what it is, is you develop, you've in, inherited a foot type that again, just like with the bunion, is a little unstable, and over time those digits start to buckle for you. Okay? So again, what do you do? Same principle as we talked about with bunions. Again, we do things, same things you saw for bunions is the same things we kind of do for hammer toes, okay? Again, your design, your, your goal of treatment is to alleviate pain, okay? So you cushion things, you go to bigger shoes, you take shoes with a bigger toe box. Remember we talked about width before, but with hammer toes, now, for a lot of folks, it becomes a question of the height of that toe box. And one of the ways you can kind of look at a shoe and see if maybe that toe box is too shallow is when you look at a shoe, particularly a leather shoe, okay? And if you look down where the toes are and you kind of see those little bumps where your toes are actually stretching that leather, what that means is, is as you're walking, those toes are doing what we talked about before. They're banging into the top of that. So the way you the way you deal with that is you look at shoes with what we refer to as a deeper or taller toe box. Literally, more room for your toes to wiggle around. If you can wiggle them around and they're not hitting the tops of the shoes, that's probably a better shoe for you. And then again, just like we talked about with, you know, bunions, we look at 
surgery as a last resort to alleviate your symptoms. Okay? Can't do it any other way. Can't, you know, if it's getting in the way of your life, then there's a number of things that we can do to help to basically straighten those toes. When they're flexible, we can take tendons and joint capsules and ligaments and, and we can lengthen them or loosen them or redirect them to help that toe straighten out. As the toe becomes more rigid, it's a little harder to do it that way. Um, that's when we have to take bone and maybe remodel the bone a little bit or in some instances, we even actually fuse the joint. All designed to get that toe to work in a more normal fashion, okay? So in fact, when we look at, <clears throat> excuse me, surgical procedures when we uh, are talking about hammer toes, we, we refer to a, a sequential reduction, which means that we start with the easy stuff, like the tendon releases and the capsule releases, and you know we, we do that, and then we check the toe to see if it's where we want it to be, and we keep moving on down the line to more aggressive procedures until we get to the point where we feel like we've got that toe in a position that's going to be comfortable. And that's kind of an example of how you approach that. Um, in this particular case, they've elected to fuse that joint meaning they're not gonna let that joint bend anymore. And the reason you would do that is because you can't get that toe to stay stable and not keep buckling up. So we say we're gonna take the bend out of that joint so that now the toe moves up and down without buckling. Okay? Anybody ever heard of this? Plantar fasciitis? Yeah, that always gets a lot of people nodding their head. So plantar fasciitis is inflammation on a big band of tissue that goes from the bottom of your heel, fans out across the entire sole of your foot, and attaches at the base of your toes. And you can kind of see that picture there, it kind of looks like the base of a triangle. And what that tissue is designed to do is to lend some support to your arch, okay? Everybody's arch, when you go from sitting down to standing up, your arch flattens a little bit. That's the way your foot's designed, okay? When you step down and you put weight on that foot, it puts tension on that plantar fascia, draws it tight. Again, that's what's supposed to happen. So what happens with plantar fasciitis is that that repetitive loading and unloading of that plantar fascia gets to be too much. Remember I told you that that tissue is designed to support your arch. It doesn't stretch, okay? If it stretched, it wouldn't do a good job of supporting your arch. So if you keep putting your foot down, and if you have the kind of, you know, biomechanics that we talked about before where your foot's maybe not quite as stable, it pulls real hard on that plantar fascia. If you think about it, you pick your foot up and put it down thousands of times a day. Probably between five and 10,000 times a day, you pick that foot up, put it down, whether you're just shifting your weight back and forth or whether you're walking down the street or running or whatever you're doing. That's a lot of repetition of yanking and relaxing. So if that gets to be too much, what typically happens is the weak point here is the attachment of that plantar fascia to the heel bone. That's why you get pain in the bottom of your heel. And for most people, the symptoms go something like this. Well, you know, I get pain towards the end of the day, my heel hurts, then, you know, I can sit down and rest and it's, it's better. But now, it's starting to be that when I get up in the morning and start to walk, those first few steps are really painful. And then I can walk a little bit more and it feels better, but then by the end of the day, it's painful again. Sound familiar? I know somebody's felt that before. So here's the good news. Five to 10% of people, this becomes chronic. Here's the really good news. And we didn't, I'm sorry, we didn't talk about the heel spur itself. Sometimes you'll hear plantar fasciitis re referred to as heel spur syndrome. Remember the chronic yanking and pulling I talked about? Sometimes that causes a reaction in the bone where that plantar fascia attaches, and that reaction in the bone can cause a bone spur. 
to be generated. Now, the spur can be little or it can be big. The spur typically doesn't hurt, okay? What causes the pain is that interface between the soft tissue and the attachment to the bone. So even in the very, very rare instances that we address this surgically, we don't do anything with that bone spur. You don't have to. You can leave it there. You can get better. It, it's not really an issue with getting you better. Here's the number I thought you were going to like. 90 to 95 percent of the time this will get better. Okay? Typically when we look at treatment we expect this to get better within about a six week period but certainly less than six months. And when we're talking about how you get it better, it basically comes down to a couple of things. And I'm probably jumping way ahead of my slides, but I don't care. So what we do is we control the initial pain, which is typically inflammation. We, can, we control that with some of those medications that we talked about before for bunions and hammer toes, anti-inflammatory medicine, just a short course of that, maybe a week or two. And then we try to rest that plantar fascia. We decrease the amount of yanking that we've got on that tissue. And the easiest way to do that is to use shoes that are really supportive, that have a good arch in them. Go buy a, the most rigid, over-the-counter arch support you can get. I, I will tell folks, if you're looking to figure out if the arch support is going to be helpful for you, it's kind of like going to the grocery store and doing that thump the melon thing, although I'm not really sure what you're supposed to hear. But basically what you're going to do is you're going to take that arch support and you're going to lay it on the, on the table. And if you take your hand and you can push down on that arch support and flatten it out, put it back, it's not going to do you any good. It's a nice cushion, but it's not going to give support to your arch. If you can take your hand and flatten it out, when you stand on it, it's sure not going to stand up to that. Okay. So like I said, 90 plus percent of the time, this gets better. Let's go back so you don't have to look at that right now. So 90 plus percent of the time, it gets better. Six weeks to maybe six months. And all of the things that we're talking about are what we refer to as conservative measures. You should not end up having surgery for this, okay? Less than 5%, all right? Ingrown toenails. Anybody ever had an ingrown toenail? Okay. This is the only gross slide I have. Okay, so if you want, I'll flip through it real quick. So anyway, look familiar? Okay. So here's, you want me to move the slide? I can talk all night about it without the picture. You want me to move the picture? So, ingrown toenail, right? So an ingrown toenail basically is caused by a part of the nail pushing up against the skin surrounding the nail. Now that can be because you went at it with your toenail clippers and left a little piece in there and as the nail started to grow forward, it pushed into that flesh. It can be because you have a shape to your toenail that's more curved than it should be and it naturally wants to grow down into that area. Now there's, there's two types of ingrown toenails. There's an acute ingrown toenail, which was that nasty picture that you saw there, where that piece of nail pushes through the surrounding flesh, creates initially inflammation, and then if you leave it there long enough, you'll pick up an infection. And that inflammation and then the infection causes the skin around that toenail to puff up and swell. When that happens, what do you think occurs? It pushes into the nail harder. So now that you push the flesh into the nail harder, it just kind of feeds on itself and it gets progressively worse. That's an acute ingrown toenail. Those are the ones that you know you go to your doctor and they put you on antibiotics. And the reality is, is that if you just go on antibiotics, most of the time it's not going to ultimately get better for good because you still haven't done anything about that piece of nail that was in there to begin with. So any treatment for an ingrown toenail needs to involve getting rid of the piece of nail that caused the problem in the first place. Okay? 
So there's a second type of ingrown toenail, which doesn't get big and red and infected like that. What happens is, you know, you do a good job trimming your nail, but because of the shape of the nail constantly pushing in there, it pushes on the skin. Remember what we talked about earlier about what happens to skin when you keep putting pressure on it? It thickens and it builds up a callus. So what will happen here is, is you build up kind of a light callus in that nail groove. Now what that does is it prevents the nail from pushing through the skin and causing the wound that causes the inflammation and the infection. Unfortunately, what happens is, is now you've got that nail edge pushing up against that thickened skin underneath and it becomes painful. Those are the ones where, you know, if, if you just push on it or if you, if you say maybe you got a bunion or something that causes your toe to twist, the pressure from the ground will just cause that kind of chronic pain. And that's truly just an issue of the shape of the nail. So again, the treatment for that is the, kind of the same thing as what you do for an acute ingrown toenail, which is we've got to get that piece of nail that's pushing into the flesh out of there. And typically what that means is a little procedure in the office where you numb the toe up way back at the base, not down where the sore toe is. I know some of you can tell me stories about that happening. But we numb it up the base of the toe away from the sore area. Then once the toe's numb, you take out just enough nail so that you, know, you bring that nail edge up to the skin edge. So you're usually talking a couple of millimeters of nail. And then most importantly, you introduce a chemical back there to kill just that part of the nail so it doesn't grow. The rest of your nail grows, but now that part that you had to peel back the skin and work your, you know, your, your, your clippers or scissors into to get rid of, that part doesn't grow. Okay? It's a really quick, easy procedure, and it's amazing how quickly it makes the pain go away. All right? So we just skipped that, didn't we? We're not going to look at that one. Okay. Ugh. You want to go backwards on that one, too? Yeah, that's a fungal infection in a nail. And what's happened is you've got a fungal bacteria. Quite frankly, it's usually the same one that causes an athlete's foot on the skin, and what typically occurs is you get a break in the skin surrounding the edge of the nail, and that bacteria works up underneath there, and it starts to replicate, multiply. And before you know it, it's now worked its way into the nail tissue and the skin underneath the nail. And when it does, it causes the nail to become very thick, and the thickness of the nail causes it to change color. Okay. Things that can predispose you to that. Well, you know, if you bump the edge of your toe and you break the skin around there, that kind of lets the bacteria get in there. Some folks with things, as you see right there, diabetes, circulatory problems, that sort of thing, set you up for it. It is an infection. Ultimately, it is a bacteria that has caused this reaction. So just like, you know, if you get a strep throat, if you're susceptible to that strep bacteria, you can get an infection. And it's kind of the same thing here. Okay? So, you know, I told you it's usually the same type bacteria. It is the same type. Sometimes it's the exact specific bacteria that causes athlete's foot. It's a fungal infection on the skin. Okay? And that's why a lot of times we see folks with both of those things together. Because if you get the infection on the skin, it doesn't take very long for that same infection to work its way into the nails, okay? So here's the thing. You can treat an, a fungal infection on the skin pretty easily with topical antifungal agents. And I'll let you in on a secret. This is, this is why most folks, when they say, oh, I think I have a fungal infection on my feet, I'm going to go over to CVS or Walgreens, I'm going to buy me a big tube of that over-the-counter stuff, and I'm going to put it on there, and lo and behold, two months later, it's back. Here's why. If you look at most of the marketing information and the, and the product information when you open up that tube of antifungal cream, you're going to buy the cream 
that says it'll get you better quickest, right? I mean, that's just, that makes perfect sense. I don't want one that I gotta treat for six weeks if I've got one over here that says it'll get me better in a week. Well, here's what happens. Most of them will make it look better in a week, maybe two weeks. Won't kill the fungal bacteria, but it'll make it look better. So what happens? One to two weeks you treat, it looks better, great. You throw the tube away, you put it in a drawer, you can't find it anywhere, two months later, it's back. I can't find that tube anywhere. Now I gotta go back to Walgreens and buy some more. It's marketing genius, isn't it? So here's, here's all you have to do. It takes six weeks of treatment even if it looks like it's all gone. Treat for six weeks, okay? That's gonna give you the best chance of this not coming back. Now having said that, remember I talked about this being an infection and I mentioned you know, going to the doctor and getting a strep throat? They put you on antibiotics. Does that mean you're never gonna get a strep throat again? No, because you're susceptible to that bacteria. So you can get it completely gone, but it doesn't mean you're never gonna have that happen again. So what I would tell you to do once you do your little six week treatment and you get it better, then I would tell you invest in just a can of over the counter antifungal spray. Once a week or so, spray your shoes, spray your feet. What it's gonna do is it's gonna decrease the chance that that bacteria is gonna come back, okay? It decreases the bacteria count, that's all it does. Now, that's how you treat the the skin infection. Unfortunately, treating the nail infection is not that easy. And the reason is, even though it's the same bacteria, you know, you would say, well, why can't I just put the cream on the nail and, and, and it'll work that way? Well, unfortunately, the infection is not just in the, in the nail plate itself. It's also in the tissue that is underneath the nail, that the nail attaches to. And what happens when you have it on your skin? Skin flakes, get all that peel and skin. Anybody who's ever seen or had a bad fungal infection in the nail, one of the things you see is you get all that debris that's underneath the nail. That's the nail plate breaking down, but it's also the skin where the nail attaches to, it's infected too. So when you use a topical medication, that topical medication has to penetrate completely through the nail plate and it's got to have enough left in it to get to the tissue where the nail is attached to. And that's just very hard to do topically. There are some tricks that you can use to increase the permeability of, of the nail plate so that you can get a little better penetration. But the reality is, statistically speaking, the best way to treat a fungal infection in your nail is with an oral antifungal agent, okay? It's basically a 12-week treatment plan, and it's about 72 to 80 percent effective, which is the highest effective rate for treating those types of infections. Okay? Let's see what else. Yes. And I experienced this before. Uh huh. The doctor I saw said that those oral antifungal medications were dangerous, very dangerous. I'm not surprised, and he's not a plant. He isn't, no he's not. But that, that's a very good question. So here's what I would tell you. <clears throat> the older antifungal medications, the uh, ketoconazole and the griseofulvin, the ones that were used 20 some odd years ago, they had about a 50% effective rate. And they were a little bit harsh on the liver. And the reason they talk about that is, is because that medication, as are the newer antifungal medications, are primarily broken down in the liver. As are a lot of things broken down in the liver, like Tylenol, like a whole host of medications you take, like beer, like wine. So here's what we do. I would tell you there's two things that we do with everyone if we are considering treating with an oral antifungal agent. Now I showed you that picture of that fungal nail infection. That 
There are other things that can make a nail look like that that are not fungal infections. So the number one thing that we do when we think we're going to treat for something like that is we take a piece of that nail and we send it off to the lab. And we're going to have the lab tell us, one, is this a fungal infection? And two, if it is, well, what kind of fungal bacteria is it? Because there's more than one and not every oral antifungal agent hits every fungal bacteria, just like antibiotics. That's why you have different antibiotics. So the first thing you have to do is make sure you got a fungal infection and you got to know what bacteria it is. And if we decide we're going to treat with an oral antifungal agent, we do a liver function study. We don't put people on those medications if they have a compromised liver. If we're, we're not going to put more stress on it if it's already damaged. So we start by getting a clean bill of health, if you will, on your liver. Then we put you on the medicine. Then we check you to make sure you're doing well. Just about all of the liver-related issues that can happen with these medications happen to people that already are taking medications that are stressing the liver and or they've got a damaged liver to start with. And the majority of folks like that, when you withdraw the antifungal agent, their liver function returns to their normal. Okay? So yeah, you just it's like any other medication. You have to be aware of why you're using the medicine and you have to monitor people when you do. Okay? Uh-huh. If, if that nail was removed for a fungal infection, yes. did they tell you to treat the nail bed for the fungal infection? I had uh, the big digging soak and I went back and forth to the doctor. But they didn't tell you to use an antifungal agent, topical antifungal agent as no, the nail grew back. She did give me, uh, uh, I can't remember the name, I think it's called nail care. Okay. So here's the problem with that. Um, first of all, the nail should grow back in a relatively uniform fashion. If you're using nail clear, it sounds like it's one of the topicals that has what's referred to as a keratolytic agent on it. They usually have like a little brush or something like that. Well, what that's going to do is it's got stuff in there that's designed to help penetrate through that nail plate. So it is going to kind of break down that tissue. So if you've now got a new nail coming out and you're painting that on there, it is going to make the nail more brittle okay. and more apt to break and become more jagged. Okay, but eventually it's going to grow completely out with all the other things, right? It should. Okay. Okay? Treatment, conservative treatment, typically will resolve this in somewhere between six weeks. By six months, we consider it to have been a failure. Now that, that being said, you know, I mean, you could get better anywhere within that period. Right. Okay, so it could be just a matter of giving it up. Yep. Okay. All right, thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> okay, so. You know, they talked to me and told me that this was, I think the, the marketing thing said something about, you know, it's summer and everybody's going to be out and everybody's going to be moving around. So I think the last couple of things we're going to talk about are things that can happen to you when you get out in all this nice weather and you start running around and exercising and enjoying the weather that caused you to move here, right? So we talked about pain on the bottom of the heel. 
the plantar fasciitis, and we talked about that being from essentially overuse, okay? On the back of your heel, there's another thing called Achilles tendinopathy or Achilles tendinitis. And the most common one we see with respect to folks who are, you know, not playing basketball and getting rebounds and stuff like that is what we refer to as an insertional tendinitis. And what that means is, you know, if you, everybody can feel the back of their ankle there and everyone, if they know one tendon in their body, it's their Achilles tendon, right? You can reach back there and feel it. And if you follow it down to where it inserts or attaches into the back of the heel, it kind of fans out and it actually attaches across the entire back of your heel. And where it attaches into the back of the heel is oftentimes a point where the tendon starts to become injured, okay? Either inflamed or it starts to have some degeneration of the tendon, again, from overuse. And that pain goes something like this, hurts. You go out and you, and you decide, you know what, I'm going to start exercising. We're going to start walking around the block. We're going to do it three times a week. And you start coming back and you go, wow, the back of my heel hurts. Okay? Hurts when you push in the back of it. Sometimes it just hurts in, in shoes. And what's happening is, is you're getting inflammation of where that tendon attaches into the back of your heel. Sometimes when we shoot an x-ray back there, we can find that you've actually developed a spur, much like you can get on the bottom of your heel with plantar fasciitis, except the problem with the spur in the back of the heel is, you know, there's not really any cushion like there is on the heel spur on the bottom of your foot. So sometimes if that spur develops, now when you get in shoes, the back of your shoes hit it, and now it's got the tendon rubbing up against the back of your shoe. And then you can also develop, and we talked about with the bunion, sometimes that when it gets big and red and swollen and you have that little bursa, that little inflammatory fluid-filled sac, those can occur back there. So all of those things can come together to create pain in the area. So, you know, things that you can do for it. Well, number one, much like we talked about with the plantar fasciitis, you know, you can use some anti-inflammatory medicine to help kind of quiet that down. Sometimes we even have you put a little heel lift in the shoe to kind of lift that, that heel a little higher and take some of that, that stress off of that Achilles tendon. That Achilles tendon is actually two tendons that blend together to form one. It's a tendon from the big calf muscle that everybody feels back there called the gastrocnemius muscle. And that one goes from your heel all the way up the back of your leg and, and begins above your knee. Deep to that is another muscle called the soleus. And it goes up the back of your leg, but it, it stops short of your knee. So those two muscles, when you straighten your knee out, when you try to pull your toes up to your nose, that stresses that Achilles tendon, okay? So when you get out and you start moving about sometimes too much, you start to get pain back there. So, as I said, anti-inflammatory medicine to decrease some of the swelling back there. And then the heel lift, by lifting that heel up a little bit, now we've taken a little tension off. Our knee straightens, but our foot, our toes aren't coming up like before. They're down a little bit. So that'll take some of the pressure off of that area. Sometimes that works. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes we have to, to rest the tendon a little more. Sometimes we will put you in a boot to help quiet that down. So that's, that's a type of overuse injury, right? Another one is this, stress fractures. Same principle. We're out, we're about, we're moving, we're exercising, we want to get in better shape, and we're so excited about this. You know, we, we take a walk around the block one night, and we go, that was easy. I'm going two blocks tomorrow. And you do that, and you're like, well, that was a challenge. You know what? I can do three blocks the next day. And before you know it, you've gone too quick, too much distance, and now, remember the the kind of foot biomechanics we talked about that kind of sets you up for the bunion deformity and the hammer toes. Now, those imperfect um, alignment of your foot, now it's coming back to get you because now we've got areas in those metatarsals that are bearing way too much stress. And what occurs is this. 
a stress fracture, unlike I fell down and broke my leg, doesn't occur from one specific instance. It, re it occurs from the repetitive stress, okay? Loading and unloading, putting the foot down, pushing off, picking it up, doing it over and over and over again. What occurs is the bones in your body, bones in your body are not like rocks, okay? The bones in your body are alive. You've got new bone cells going in all the time, and we've got old bone cells coming out all the time. We're constantly turning bone over in all the bones in your body. And it happens <clears throat> with a nice equilibrium. There's a nice balance to that. Old bone out, new bone in. When you do it in a nice balance, the bone maintains its strength, okay? When you start to get these small repetitive micro stresses on the bone, what happens is, is that balance goes out of balance. Now we've got old bone cells coming out quicker than we've got new bone cells going in, and now the bone's getting weaker, okay? When that happens, you start to get stuff like this. Hey, you know that third day when we did the, the three times around the block? Man, when I came back, my foot was sore. I went home, we sat down, watched some TV, went to bed, woke up the next morning, it felt great. No problems. So you keep doing that. And pretty soon what you start to notice is, hey, you know what? I didn't get all the way through the three blocks and my foot started to hurt. I only got like two blocks, but I kept going because I'm going to get in good shape. It hurt. And now I go to bed and it still hurts a little bit, but it's okay by the next morning. And you keep doing this, and what you start to find is, hey, it's starting to hurt earlier, and it's taking longer to get better, okay? That's what's referred to as a stress reaction. That's what occurs when the bone is starting to get weaker, and you're starting to put more stress on it. And then this happens. Now you start walking, and you look down, and you go, ooh, my foot's swollen. Wow, that hurts. I'm going to go home and sit down. And you go home and you rest and you put ice on it and maybe you take some anti-inflammatory medicine and you wake up the next morning, hey, it's still swollen. It still hurts. That is when you've developed the stress fracture. So the moral of this story is I want you to be active. I want you to get out there and enjoy the good weather. But I want you to be cautious and sensible about what you're doing. Okay, if, if the most exercise you've done all winter long is to go from the couch to the TV or the refrigerator, okay, that's fair. You gotta start somewhere. When you go out there and you start doing things, be sensible about it. Do one time around the block. Do it every other day. Don't increase the activity. Once you get going, you don't wanna increase by more than about 25% a week. You want to go slow. If you do that, your body will, will get a, a used to this and you'll be fine. But remember, it took you a long time to fall out of shape. Give yourself time to get back into shape. And you can do it. And if you take your time and if you don't try to do it all in one week, you should be able to avoid stuff like this. Okay. We just went all over that. Now you can ask questions.